asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Right, let's welcome back our next guest. I say welcome back because he joined the programme back in March last year. We had a great chat with him then. He's a very well-known politician, not only in his native Scotland, but around the world as well. He's a socialist politician and broadcaster as well these days. He has been a member of Labour, the Scottish Socialist Party, and he formed Solidarity back in 2006. I've never been much of a fan of politicians, it must be said, but I like him and I won't uh, pretend I don't. He was jailed back in the early 90s for basically standing up to poll tax and when people are prepared to go to prison for their convictions. Well, you've got to admire that. There's a lot to talk about. Scottish independence, Brexit, um, Syria, of course, Palestine, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party, anti-Semitism. Let's welcome back to the programme, uh, Tommy Sheridan. Tommy, welcome back. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm telling you, well, that's a lovely introduction you've given me, brother, and the... Uh, you can assure all the listeners that the cheque is in the post. Thank you very much. Well, it's genuine. There's no listen. There's no point in pretending that you're impartial when you're not. I mean, I well, you know, I think that's a brilliant point, uh, Richie, because there are so many commentators out there who try and pr- promote this idea of independence when the truth is they are firmly on the side of the establishment. I mean, the the, the British mainstream media now is, is quite simply a, a cesspit of bias uh, in favour of the, the powerful and the privileged and uh, the way they hit the drumbeats of war recently for attacking Syria uh, was, was just sickening, it was nauseating, you know. I wish some of these um, hired liars in the Fleet Street and in the, the mainstream media would be the first on the planes to, to go into these wars, but it's, it's always conducted from the safety of their keyboards and their comfortable offices, you know. Yeah, it's very easy to agree to dropping bombs on people thousands of miles away while you're having tea and scones of an afternoon. Um, I agree with you. Tommy, there's loads to talk about. Thanks for giving us your time today. Funny we, Pleasure. funny we talk about the mainstream media because the Daily Record would have you believe that there's no real appetite for a second independence referendum in Scotland. But while I don't claim to be, because obviously I'm based in Manchester and the programme covers a lot of kind of geopolitical issues, which of course the Scottish referendum is, Scottish independence is an important issue of course, but I'm not on the ground there, but I'm guessing the, Scot- the, the Daily Record is being a bit disingenuous in its claims that there's not an appetite for the second referendum. I'm guessing there probably is. Well, put it this way, Richie, when you get a newspaper that is unionist to the core, that campaigned against independence with every single fibre uh, and tried to persuade its readers that we'd be much better together uh, in the UK. They told us that we would save our shipbuilding jobs. That was a lie. They told us they would save the civil service jobs. That was a lie. And they told us, uh, believe it or not, that the only way to stay in Europe was to vote against independence. And, of course, that was a lie. So papers like the Daily Record, papers like the Herald, papers like the Scotsman, these are the main newspapers in Scotland. Every single one of them campaigned against independence. And every single one of them now tells us, oh, there's no appetite for a new independence referendum. Well, I'm sorry. We now have a democratic mandate that was secured at the election of 2016, Scottish Parliament elections, that elected a pro-independence majority in the Scottish Parliament. In March last year, Richie, after several weeks of debate, the Parliament voted quite clearly by a 10 majority to conduct a second independence referendum. That's democracy, and I'm afraid nobody voted for the Daily Record, but people voted for these politicians in the Scottish Parliament. So we have a mandate for Indiref 2, and the debate right now is about when to hold it, because the mandate was to hold it between now uh, and next year, uh, the spring of 2020. Personally, Richie, I have to say, I would like to see in September 
this year after a three month short campaign uh, however I could live with next year March next year but I think it's best to go now when the ruins of the British state are open for us all to see now on that what about those who say to Scottish nationalists now again from a distance as, as somebody who is an Irish Republican of course I would have supported Scottish people's rights to you know, secede from the Union. Absolutely. Of course I would as an Irish Republican. But what about what about those who voted here in the UK to leave the European Union for whatever reasons they did? And they say to Scottish nationalists, they say, well, you know, fair enough, we understand your absolute rights to self-determination or your rights to vote on that, but why are you so hard on our decision to leave the European Union? Why don't you equally support that decision that we made? What would you say to that, Tommy? I think the democratic argument, Richie, is quite clear, and that is that England voted to leave the European Union. There's, yeah. there's no doubt that that's what happened. Scotland, on the other hand, and by the way, I'm you know quite clearly, I'm a socialist. I'm of the Benite variety. I don't recognise that the European Union is anything other than a big bosses club yeah. to promote and, and sustain free market capitalism and push for privatisation. So I'm no fan of the European Union. I voted to leave the European Union, but 66% of Scotland voted to stay in the European Union. And there is your democratic yeah, conundrum. Enough. That's the democratic conundrum, because what we have to understand here in Scotland, and, and that's why Indirect 2 is so important to me, is we have to understand that we cannot continue to keep doing what England tells us to do. Because we never voted for Theresa May, we never voted for David Cameron, but we ended up with those two governments. Scotland voted against the Tory government. Scotland voted against leaving the European Union, but we are being frog-marched into these decisions. Now, if we lose the next referendum, I'm, I'll put my hand in my heart, I'm not going to give up campaigning for independence, but it, it will be off the table for a few years, there's no doubt about it. But we have a mandate because of the change conditions since 2014, because we've exposed the lies of the British government with a so-called vow of new powers. We've exposed the lies of the idea that the only way to stay in the European Union was to vote for the UK. We've exposed the lies of the job losses that apparently were going to happen in the Clyde if we voted to stay in the UK. Guess what? Those job losses are going ahead because we voted to stay in the UK. So we've exposed all of these things. And key point here, Richie, the SNP won a renewed mandate in 2016 by winning a majority at the Scottish Parliament. And I have to say, um, the, the idea of winning a, a majority at the Scottish uh, Parliament, uh, an independence majority with green votes, that was supposed to be ruled out. The, the, the people who were the architects of the Scottish Parliament didn't want any one party to, to be able to, to have a majority. But the SNP won a majority in 2011. They still have a majority in coalition with the Greens in 2018. So, so we have a mandate. And, you know, if you have a big, long debate in Parliament and you expend a lot of, of angry words and, and debate across the chamber and you take a decision and then you don't do anything about it, then most people would turn around and say, well, what's the use of having a parliament? We've got the decision, let's go on with the referendum. Absolutely. No, I, of course I absolutely endorse that. And I would, again, obviously be watching from a distance with great interest when that referendum occurs. And of course I'll be hoping that the Scottish people vote to leave. Between me and you, without getting into it really, I, I've got my doubts about the original referendum result, but um, then people say you're a conspiracy theorist, Richie, but I've got my doubts about it. Let me say this to you, though, because... Richie, for goodness sakes, we, we, we all must know now, we, we, that, for instance, the, the faked uh, weapons of mass destruction that were yeah, supposed to yeah, be in yeah. Iraq, the idea that there are not conspiracies going on at the very highest level in society is simply nonsense. Now, whether we agree to certain people's extent of conspiracies or not, well, we can have an open debate about that. But the idea that the ruling class don't conspire to keep power 
is just nonsense. If you don't believe they're conspiring, I'm afraid you still believe in the fairies. Uh, the, the, the truth is, the British establishment with the American superpower, they decided against independence in 2014 because it would have affected the nuclear weapon situation across the planet. Because let's remember... One of the most important reasons to vote for independence was because of the commitment by the SNP and by the independence movement for unilateral nuclear disarmament. If we had voted for independence in 2014, right now we would be in the process of either decommissioning or moving those submarines where they belong in the River Thames, right next to the Houses of Parliament, so that the MPs who say they're safe can work every day with them on their doorstep. Now, it's a brilliant image, that, isn't it? But, again, I would go along with that. I would probably go a little bit further, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, as to why maybe I believe there was some doubt as to the legitimacy of the original result. But, again, that's for another time. If the Scottish people go to the polls and vote to leave. You then, like I've spoken to other Scottish politicians and commentators on this programme who, like me and like you, don't have any truck with the European Union. You've got a whole new fight on your hands then to persuade people, well, look, we've voted for independence. We've, we've, we've extricated ourselves from London. This is great. We've got self-determination properly. Why would we want to hand control of the country over to the European Union. That would be a massive struggle then, I would guess. Richie, of course it would. But there's a key difference here, Richie, an absolutely critical difference. I and many independent supporters after independence would be arguing that we should do a Norway, that we should be really independent, that we should take our own economic and social and political decisions, that we should be friends with Europe not be subjugated by Europe, that we don't replace Brussels, uh, uh, replace Westminster with Brussels. I, 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 I'm clear that that will be an argument. But do you know what? I might lose that argument. I might lose that argument. But I could live with losing that argument because the people of Scotland will have decided, not the people of England for Scotland. That's the difference, the critical yeah. difference. I mean, let, let's put it this way, Richard. There's other issues, I think important issues. I don't want to live any longer in a monarchy. I don't want to be somebody's uh, subject. I want to be a citizen. I want Scotland to be an independent socialist republic. So that means that we don't put the royal family, as some uh, of the uh, uh, SNP supporters want to do, they say we should have a slimmed-down monarchy. I don't want a slimmed-down monarchy. I don't want them in slim fast or any other diet. I just don't want them having any control over my life. So we have to have a democratic modern republic. That has to go to a vote as well. If I lost that, then I would need to live with it. But again, that decision would be taken by the people of Scotland. Similarly, in relation to membership of NATO, I think it's inconsistent and inconceivable that we get rid of nuclear weapons but stay members of a nuclear alliance, which is what NATO is. I want out of NATO as well. If I lose that argument, again, you live with it because your country takes that decision. But Richie, what I can't take is another country taking my decisions. Fair enough, Tommy. The last thing, on, by the way, folks, if you're just tuning in, Tommy Sheridan is our guest uh, this hour. It's great to have Tommy back in the programme. It's about a year or so since we last spoke with him. He's a, obviously a broadcaster, socialist politician, former MSP, and of course the man who formed Solidarity. And I mentioned um, he's had an incredibly checkered career, uh, Tommy. It's a uh, film worthy, I think, uh, the journey he's been on for the last 25, 30, even 40 years. Um, going to prison for defying a court order um, over the poll tax um, disgrace, which I remember. I was a very young man at the time, but I remembered. So it's good to have Tommy on. Just before we talk about Syria, the reporting, because I know you're very interested in how the media reports on things like Syria, how it's being reporting on Russia, the Skripal case, all of that. I know you've got your opinions on it. You must have some sympathy with those who chose to, to to vote, and fair enough, you said it was an English decision, I can't argue with that, um, who voted to leave the European Union. What they're being subjected to 
in terms of they're being declared by the likes of you know war criminals like Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson. They're basically being being called xenophobic little Englanders. Um, they were stupid. They didn't know what they were voting for. We should stay in a customs union. I think what we're seeing, and this is this is my opinion. Obviously, yours is of more interest to our listeners. But we're seeing a dismantling of that democratic decision. We're seeing it in front of our eyes with respect to you know, what, even Theresa May being pressured now to keep the UK part of some sort of customs union. Um, it looks like that's going to happen, which effectively would mean that the, you know, the UK, I know you're going to take umbrage with that, but let's say England won't be leaving the European Union. Do you have sympathy with those who voted to leave and what's happening now? Richard, there's no doubt that there was a multitude of reasons that people voted the way they did. Some people obviously were, I think, seduced by the very simplistic, right-wing, nationalistic arguments of the Farages of the world that uh, we should be frightened of the people who every day of the week save lives on our NHS uh, known as immigrants, that we should be frightened of other human beings. It's all right to bomb them, but don't dare welcome them as refugees. So some people were succumbed by those horrible right-wing jingoistic uh, ideas. But there was another large section of people who could think for themselves. I mean, the, the idea, for instance, the SNP up until the uh, early 80s, um, people like the, the Tony Benz, the Bob Cruz legends in the labour and trade union movement, they campaigned vigorously against the European Union because they saw it was a tool of big business, a tool to promote privatisation of railways, privatisation of um, postal services, privatisation of shipping services. The European Union isn't some wee cuddly toy. The European Union is sitting idly by while Madrid crushes, crushes with a fascistic boot the wishes and aspirations of the Catalan people who have voted for their own independence. Where's the European Union uh, in relation to that uh, crushing of democracy. Where's the European Union in relation to the use of phosphorus bombs by the Israeli apartheid government against the, the Palestinian people? Where is the European Union's outcry about the use of snipers to kill children uh, in, in, at, the, at the border of Israel and Palestine? The European Union is a tool, a tool of big business in order to promote free market economy, profit at all costs. I am no friend of the European Union, and some no. of those, many of those who voted against the European Union, voted for good, sound political reasons. Not all of them for jingoistic, right-wing or racist uh, uh, reasons. I speak to socialists in Manchester, and they're good people, and I like them. And like yourself, they've lived it. You know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating with them, with the way they conduct themselves. And like yourself, they don't have any truck with hating people because of where they come from. But they would say, Tommy, and they have said to me, and I, I go along with them, they would say, of course, you know, nobody wants to be seen to be criticising people who've come in to take jobs in the NHS that needed to be filled from around the world, nurses and doctors and stuff. But they would also say, we have seen very low semi-skilled Mig migration over the years that has driven down wages and has had an effect on living standards in the country and has put vote, you know put pressure Absolutely. on public Richie, services. Richie, right. That is undeniable, mate. Yeah. That is undeniable. Un absolutely undeniable. And my problem is, and it's, 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 it's mastery, it's, it's, it's pure history if you look at it. The ruling classes have always managed to maintain the positions of power through divide and conquer. Yeah. Because who do we then blame for the lower wage rates? Who do we then blame for the poorer working conditions? What we get stoked again in our mass hysteria media is let's blame the immigrants. Let's not blame the boss who decides that he can get a Polish or a Lithuanian joiner to work for less than, a, than an English uh, joiner. We don't blame him because he's trying to get bigger profits. We blame the Lithuanian or the Pole. And it's from my point of view that the way to deal with that problem is to set minimum standards. 
standards, legislation, which means you don't have a minimum wage, you have a living wage, and no one is allowed to work below those uh, living wages. No one is uh, allowed to have less than the standard employment uh, conditions that are determined by the International Labour Organization. We are the least regulated workforce now in the whole of Europe. We are the easiest to fire, we have got the lowest pensions, and we've got the lowest trade union density in terms of membership. That is a position that's been created not by the immigrants. Let's not blame the immigrants for low pay. There was low pay long before the immigrants came. The immigrants are some of the victims of low pay, Richie. So that's my, I mean, I'm not taking away from the yeah, crux yeah, yeah. of your argument, but I would, I would turn that argument around. No, it's good, Tommy. Look, look I, I have a lot of, I'm no Mother Teresa. I never have been and I never will be. And I, I, I suppose I don't identify as anything, but I'm often called socialist because I do believe that the people should own the means of production. You know, I do believe in a lot of social ideals, socialist ideals. And I come from, you know, a very left-wing background. And when I grew up, I supported the Labour Party in Ireland and Sinn Féin. There's no doubt about that. But I well, do... Richie, today, today is a very, very important day for you, of course. Of course it is. Today, today was the declaration from Patrick Pearce um, that the Irish Republic was being announced. Now, unfortunately, as we know, what happened thereafter led to the crushing of that aspiration and that dream. But martyrdom was created and the legend of the likes of Pierce and Connolly was created. And let's be honest, the part of the British state was defeated. Not all of it, unfortunately. But the dream lives on of a united island. So many people have walked before us and are giants before us. And what we do is we try and walk on their shoulders, Richie, each and every one of us. You've just described what I think is the majority of working class people. I call them unconscious socialists. Yeah. People who believe in fairness and justice yeah. and equality but they don't call themselves socialists because it's been dirtied as a word and it's been, it's been distorted as, as, as a term. But I think most people in their heart of hearts believe in basic justice. As Bill Shankler used to say, where everybody works hard and everybody shares in the rewards. It's the way I see football. It's the way I see life. And that's what made him a socialist. And from my point of view, most working class people I like that. Yes, there are others, the minority, I think, who don't think like that. But most of us, most of us, think in socialist terms. By the way, Tommy's just alluded to Easter Monday, 1916, 102, yeah, 102 years ago, uh, Podrick Pierce read the proclamation of the Irish Republic. I'm going to be honest, um, work being what it is, I'd forgotten about it, to be honest. And of course, Easter well, was go. several there weeks you ago. Go. You've reminded me, you've reminded and, and And as a history graduate, of course, I've, I've, um, I've obviously written and, and read a lot about it. Listen, the point I was going to make, right, you talked about the jingoistic stuff and you talked about the right wing folks. I have sympathy with them, Tommy. I have, I don't agree with them. And I will talk to them and I will say, well, look, exactly as you said there, don't blame the man from Lithuania, the man from Poland. Certainly do not blame the poor bastard. God love him. I shouldn't say that. But the man whose house has been destroyed and his children have been murdered in Syria, who's come over here, how could you possibly blame him? Look at those responsible for it. That is absolutely true. But I still have a bit of sympathy because they don't know any better, Tommy. They're as much victims, these people that we label as alt-right or far-right, and the media wants us to hate them. And what it wants us to do, I think, is to isolate them and play a game of identity politics with them, instead of not isolating them, not marginalising them, not calling them racist and bigots all the time, and actually engaging with them. Now, I know you've done this your entire life, but it doesn't happen Let's anymore. We, 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 okay, it was, yeah, listen, go ahead. Richie, see if we don't engage with people, then what we're doing is we're ignoring part of our class. Yeah. E education is key to all of this, uh, brother, in my opinion. You know, the reason the pioneers of the Labour movement emblazoned on their banners, educate, agitate, organise. I mean, educate was number one because we have to educate. We have to explain that the boss is the one that's pulling the strings. The boss is the one that's seeking to divide and conquer. It's not the poor wee worker 
He's just trying to make a Absolutely. living for his family the same way as every other worker is doing. And from my point of view, what we've got, you know, I, I remember a, a song that uh, w- w- would resonate with you. Uh, it, it was written by a, a famous um, Scottish folk singer, um, and it was called Any Mick Will Do. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. basically it was about the Birmingham Six, the Girl for Four, the Maguire family. And, and the, the, the line basically was, when a scapegoat's what you need, any mick will do. And of course, that was the situation in the 80s. The Irish were the scapegoats. I think now you look into the 90s and the noughties and it becomes the Muslims are the scapegoats. Anybody's face that doesn't fit is the scapegoat. Any poor wee bugger that's different is the scapegoat. And I think what we've got to start trying to do is educate people that deep down we're all the same. We're all uh, those that are trying to make a living. We're selling our labour power in order to make a living. It's those that are buying the labour power and selling um, uh, ordinary people down the river every day. They're the ones that we should be after, the, the rich who have a go at people in benefits and call them dodgers, but refuse to pay their bloody taxes. They're the real dodgers. They're the ones that we should begin after, Richie. But of course, the media doesn't do that because they're owned by the tax dodgers. That's the truth. They are, and of course, they promote the divide-and-conquer identity politics game, where which, which we see played out. It, Tommy uh, Tommy Sheridan is our guest. It's just coming to the top of the year. Tommy, I want to talk about Syria and I want to talk a little bit about anti-Semitism. Are you okay to stay with me for another few minutes? Of How course, are you? Richie. Yes, of course. No, it's brilliant uh, to have you on. If you're if you're if you're good to go for another twenty minutes, I'm delighted with that. No problem, brother. Um, thanks for that because I did say a half an hour, didn't I? And, and we are approaching yeah, on that. No I, problem, brother. I do um, I do lose the run of myself. What, before we talk about anti-Semitism, Jeremy Corbyn, Ken Livingston, all the rest of it, you must be sitting there, having seen so many of these wars of aggression, imperialist wars for years and years and years and years, watching the media cover what's been going on in Syria. We saw the extraordinary scenes on Sky News where British Army uh, generals, commanders in Iraq are being cut off the air because they're challenging the narrative that Assad is a crazed madman who's gassing his people. Jeremy Corbyn has been screamed at. You've got to condemn Assad. You've got to endorse the notion that he used chemical, chemical weapons. If you don't, you're some sort of a Russophile or you're some sort of a, a traitor. What's going on, Tommy? How are you reading this? Richie, we have to, in, in politics generally, and in, in, in our understanding of current affairs, we, we have to reach for the basics. You know, the, 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 there's, there's a saying that has managed to stand the test of time that the first casualty of war is the truth. Uh, and, and quite clearly there is a war going on, a neocon, neoliberal war going on for influence, for power, for control of oil pipelines and oil resources. And part and parcel of that ongoing war was Iraq, was Afghanistan, was Libya, is Syria. We have a situation here where, if we want to personalise it, we have the likes of that idiot Boris Johnson, who is supposed to be a foreign secretary, who's no more than a buffoon as far as I'm concerned, who is pontificating day after day about evidence and how we know that the uh, government of Syria attack Duma with chemical weapons. Why the hell do we do that? I don't know. They're winning the war. So why the hell would they attack Duma with chemical weapons? Why the hell would Russia, in the eve of a, a World Cup that they're hosting, why they would try and poison the Skripals? Um, it's just utter garbage. And people garbage. who buy it, I mean, I, 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 I lose um, tolerance for, for people who buy this narrative. I, can, I suppose I can't blame them because it's a uniformity in, in the media. It's garbage, and it's not evidence-based at all. If you want to believe the likes of Boris Johnson, go ahead. I prefer to believe the likes of Robert Fisk. I, I, I look at what Robert Fisk is doing in the last 40 odd years of reporting in the front line across the Middle East. I look at the fact that he goes to Duma 
that he goes to the hospital where the infamous video was shot. He speaks to the doctors, he speaks to people who were there, and they tell you that yes, there was coughing and spluttering. Yes, there was water thrown over those that were victims of the coughing and spluttering because there was shelling of the area. The, most of the people are moving about in tunnels. There was huge uh, wind storms during the, the shelling. Of course, people couldn't breathe. There was uh, an inability to breathe properly. That's what happened. There was no chemical weapons used. There's no evidence of chemical weapons used. And the fact that the OPWC can't give us the evidence is, is for part and parcel of the, the, the nonsense of that particular narrative. So from my point of view, when you're looking for the idea and the explanation by these things, Richie, we have to look into the basics. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I describe myself as a magpie Marxist. Which what that means is, is I think Marx was one of the greatest philosophers and social campaigners on the planet. I think he, the way he dissected and explained capitalism was absolutely brilliant. What I like to do is I like to dip into Marxist ideas because I don't think we should ever uh, have an attitude of uh, someone is 100% right and someone's yeah. 100% yeah. wrong. So I'm a magpie Marxist, but Marx used to always say, his advice to his followers was always doubt all things. Doubt all things. Well, I think that's what we've got to do as far as the media is concerned. Doubt all things. The media is owned and controlled in the UK by five billionaires. Five billionaires who have got no interest in what working class people think or what working class people need. No interest in good wages because they want to uh, make sure they get more profit out of people. No interest in public services because they, they profit from privatisation. We should never, ever support what these people are putting in the papers or listen to the British Bias Corporation that is no more than a tool for the British state. Tommy Sheridan is our guest. We've got Tommy for another 10, 15 minutes. Do um, tweet um, if you've got comments. Now, there has been an awful lot of tweets on this. I'm not surprised. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Follow Tommy on Twitter. His uh, Twitter handle is at Citizen Tommy. Follow him there, at Citizen Tommy. Massive amount of tweets. If you want to see what people are tweeting us, where it says search Twitter, put Richie Allen Show in all one word, press enter, and away you go. Of course, you watched with interest the Israeli Defence Force response to the right of return protests in Gaza. Um, LiveLeak.com, one of the world's biggest websites, which I don't know if you know, Tommy, but it's run out of Manchester by a Mancunian called Hayden Hewitt. Um, does amazing I didn't work. know that. Yeah. I've watched it. I didn't know it was run from Manchester. Well, well done to that man. Yeah, it's 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 owned as a kind of a little cooperative by four guys. They don't make any money out of it, but it's in the top 200 Brilliant. biggest websites in the world. And what they do, of course, is, as Tommy knows, they allow videos be published that you would never see anywhere else. Some of them are distressing videos, but they give you a picture of what's going on. And we saw children, teenagers being shot dead by the Israeli Defence Forces. Do you think, I mean, I don't believe in coincidences. All this is going on. And today, Jeremy Corbyn has met with um, various Jewish groups. Now, I think political party leaders should meet with everybody. Um, everybody should have access to uh, politicians and to leaders of parties. I have no issue with that. But um, writing in today's evening standard, Corbyn said some things that I would find very worrying about what is and what isn't acceptable when it comes to criticising the Israeli government and its actions. Is Corbyn... Has Corbyn given in to the, I would call them the Zionist lobby? It's got nothing to do with Jewish people living in the UK. Has he given in? Has he acquiesced? And are these dangerous times when the leader of the Labour Party won't stand up to these people and say, listen, of course people shouldn't be blaming the Jews for this or that. Of course people shouldn't be shouting at Jews that the Holocaust never happened. Of course they shouldn't be doing that. But don't be telling us that if somebody says that is, is the Israeli government is behaving like the Nazis... That that's racist. It might be very strong, but it ain't racist. What do you think, Tommy? Richie, you and I, I think maybe of, of similar age. I'm 54 years of age, but when I was growing up and becoming aware of the world, the cause that grasped all of our attention as youngsters and, and got me into politics was the apartheid struggle. 
was the the struggle to free South Africa from that horrible, um, crazed, apartheid regime. And I think that became a badge of honour. It became, uh, uh, you, you talked earlier about identity politics. Well, I think that was an, a, a badge of identity. You were either with justice or you were against justice. You were with Thatcher, who called Nelson Mandela a terrorist, yeah. or you were with the overwhelming majority of people who called him a freedom fighter. And from my point of view, the South Africa of today is the state of Israel. Israel is practicing apartheid. Israel is acting like a terrorist state. Israel is crushing the people of Palestine, stealing more and more of the land, killing people indiscriminately. Any other country in the world would currently be on the target list for bombing if they were to do what Israel has been doing. It, it, it fills me with so much anger, uh, Richie, that we have this narrative being pushed very cleverly by the Zionist lobby who are trying to turn attention away from what Israel is doing and murdering people on a daily basis in Palestine towards the apparent existence of anti-Semitism within the Labour uh, Party. I've got to say to you, Every single party, if it reflects society, will have some anti-Semites in it. Because anti-Semitism is part of society. It's the darkness of society, like racism, like bigotry, like sexism. Every party will have some of it. But the idea that the Labour Party is get any more than the Tory party, for instance, is just garbage. It's just utter garbage. And my fear, I, I, I like Jeremy a lot, I think he's a principled man, I think he's a principled socialist. My fear is he's coming under so much pressure by this Zionist lobby that he's perhaps succumbing a bit to, to that pressure. I would appeal to Jeremy, as I've appealed to him on the question of independence, I would appeal to him on this question to stand firm. Because history will tell us, history will tell us that standing against Israel and everything they're doing against the Palestinian people is the right thing to do. It's not anti-Semitic at all. It's anti-Zionism. It's two different things. We have to learn... By the way, David Stewart Cole wants to say hello to you. He remembers you walking through the Midlands as a young anti-poll tax activist and your speeches were always brilliant. That's a lovely thing, that... Um, oh, that was lovely. Thanks, yeah. thanks David. So, David, uh, yeah, follow Tommy on, on Twitter. It's at Citizen uh, Tommy there. I'm not going to apologise for people who hate people for no other reason than they look a certain way or they, you know, they aspire to a certain religious philosophy. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not going to make apologies for people like that. But I'm, I'm worried, Tommy, that... Now, you, you're going to roll your eyes here, but this... We're moving into this kind of era where we're saying, and, and a lot of this is coming through the media, a lot of it is coming from, a, I would say, a kind of an extremist element that are gaining a kind of a foothold in the Labour Party at the moment. That, you know, people have, people should have the right to go through their lives or go about their lives without ever being offended or without ever being confronted by people whose ideas they might find repugnant. And I think, Tommy, in a free society, this is a terribly dangerous thing. If there are people who think, right, that well, Jews are evil, Jews are twisted, Jews are sick, and Jews are responsible for all the ills of the world, which is patently ridiculous, what are you going to do with them? You can't um, send them to an island, uh, send them off to Coventry or send them into exile. You can't put them in prison. But we just have to live with people who have these ideas and just put up with it, is what I would say. But there's an anti-kind of tolerance... Co and I'm, I'm not saying we should tolerate those ideas, but I worry that, you, you know, there's a kind of a hijacking of the language and there's, they're trying to create a kind of a sterile society, a sterile world where nobody can say anything lest it be considered unsayable or unthinkable. And if you are to say it or you are to think it, well then, you know, you're ostracised, you're outcast. Tommy, I'm not explaining this very well. I think you know what I'm getting at. Well, it's not good, right? I, I actually think what you're getting at is it's almost a paraphrasing of Pastor Niemöller himself. Because if 
if we start to have a, a Gestapo of language and a, a Gestapo of behavior, uh, you know, who's next? Yeah. If, you, if, if you can't say one thing today, what is it you can't say tomorrow? And what is it you can't say the next day? And just as Pastor Nehmer said when they came for the Jews, nobody said anything because yeah. they weren't the Jews. And, and then they came for the trade unionists, and nobody said anything because they weren't the trade unionists. And then they came for the socialists, nobody said anything. They weren't the socialists. And by the time they came for those that were left, there was nobody left to say anything. And I think we have to be very, very careful. That... Pastor Nimula's statement wasn't just a warning against fascism in Germany in 1936-37. That was, I think, a warning to society as a whole that we have to have tolerance, but we also have to guard against incitement. There's a difference between saying something and inciting people, Richie. Um, you, you and I may hold particular views. I, I despise the ruling class of this society who I think are the biggest robbers on the planet who continually pay their workers poverty pay but refuse to pay their taxes. That's my opinion. But if I was to call for people to take out the head of Unilever or the, the head of Amazon because they don't pay their taxes or Starbucks or whatever, then that would be incitement and that would be different. So I think we have to uh, have the freedom to express our views but not uh, incite uh, action that would harm others. That's a very good point and, and laws exist already. That's why I've said to people before, I've had people on this programme before, Tommy, and I've had everybody on. Uh, listen, I'm not virtue signalling here. I am not, but I've had everybody on. I've had Holocaust yep. deniers on. I've argued with them. I've told them what I think and what I've learned through my own travels. They've gone away. I've had people on from a very right-wing Christian background and they don't like um, homosexuality and we've talked about that. And I don't agree with these people, but I also don't want them ostracised. And I'm quite happy if they're living next door to me. I'm quite happy to to get on with them and talk to them and just say, well, look, I don't agree with that. You're absolutely right about the incitement. When people say, you know, uh, the Jews, and and, and then that becomes, well, you know, if something happened to that guy, to that Jewish guy, well, that would be no bad thing. Well, that's not acceptable, but we have laws to deal with that. And th- th- you see, there's a difference. That there's a there's a an issue which not all of your listeners will be aware of, so I, I won't dwell on it too much. But there's a there's an issue recently in Scotland over the repeal of a piece of legislation called the Offensive Behaviour of Football Act, and and this was this was a piece of legislation that, in my opinion, w- was brought in. Um, as, as an idiot reaction to sectarianism in Scotland at football matches, and there's undoubtedly a sectarian problem in, in Scotland. There's, there's no no doubt, no denying that. But the idea that you bring in a piece of legislation that targets football fans, yeah. then it was just garbage. It was just nonsense. It was political PC brigade gone daft, and and the SNP tried to defend it, and I think they were wrong to defend it. The, the parliament has now had a debate and they've agreed to repeal that piece of legislation. And that's the right thing to do because it was criminalising football fans for singing songs, for instance, about James Connolly, for singing songs about the Easter uprising, for, for waving Palestinian flags at Parkhead in, 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 in Glasgow. That's not a criminal act. That should never be a criminal act, in my opinion. Incitement to uh, racist acts, incitement to violence, yeah, let's, let's criminalise that. But we already have on the statute book more than enough laws to actually deal with that form of incitement. So, in, in many respects, what I'm giving you here is an example of when this Gestapo speak goes overboard and you bring in legislation, a bit like the Dangerous Dogs Act and how much yeah. garbage it was, <laughs> um, you have to understand that legislation shouldn't be the first port of call. It should be the last port of call when, when you've tried everything else. Absolutely. I remember years ago, and again, it's going to sound like I'm virtuous signal, but I swear to God I'm not. I've been wrong so many times, uh, and I am wrong so many times today. That's the beauty of living and learning, I suppose. But years ago, I was at a, a meeting of um, Sinn Féin in Waterford City, years and years and years ago. And they were talking about the Garvahi Road. And I, not foolishly, because you should always say what you feel and what you think. And I said, um, don't don't ban the orangemen from walking down the Garvahi Road and playing 
their songs. Um, go and sit in the gardens with um, your picnic tables and your deck chairs and when they're passing, offer them a drink. And, and, and I nearly got a dig, right? And I was like, why, Richie, why? And I said, because however much you might be against them, what about right of freedom of movement and freedom of speech? Pass them on. If they get out of order and they reject your offer of a drink and you're, you know, waving them on as they're walking by, well, then let the police deal with that. But in the meantime, freedom of speech, freedom of movement. And I, I really did mean that, but I got absolutely hammered for it. It's um, 17 and a half minutes past the hour. We've only got a couple more minutes with uh, Tommy. Tommy, I mentioned this to you last March. I think we spoke on Patrick's Day or the day before Patrick's Day last March. I want to ask you again, final question for you. And it is coming up on Twitter. Um, the system is broken. Democracy is not the answer. Now, I'm no anarchist, by the way, but I do believe this. We can't vote our way out of this shite. I don't believe that. What do you say to people who really believe that deep down, like myself, to the core of their being? We cannot vote our way out of it. The system is rigged. No chance. What do you say? Well, earlier I referred to the original labour movement banners, the early pioneers of socialist change, uh, Richie. Educate, agitate, organise. Uh, vote isn't on that. You know, in, in those days, in the early uh, pioneers of the movement, the, the working class didn't have the vote. So, you know, educate, agitate, organise. That, that, that's that got to be the guidance for each and every one of us. I, I say to any of your listeners, particularly those who are in mundane, often low-paid jobs, join a union. Get your workplace unionised. You on your own. You're always going to be isolated. You're always going to be picked off. But if you join together, uh, you become stronger because instead of uh, the boss taking on you as an individual, he's taking on you as a representative of all of the workers. And, and from my point of view, my whole life, I've practiced and tried to preach human solidarity, the idea of coming together. That doesn't mean we're always going to uh, like each other, Richie. For God's sake, you know, uh, life is not grey. We're not all the same. We've, we've got our own wee piccadillos and we've got our own wee likes and dislikes. But when it comes to the big issues in life, so of war and justice and inequality, surely we can come together to forge a new and a better society that's based on humanity, that's based on cooperation, that's based on love not based on hate, not based on division, not based on the idea of destruction. I mean, I, I, I just seen a, a wee piece on the TV the other day and it, it pissed me off so much, Richie. It was a, a, a wee piece that was about music lessons in Scotland. We've got 20, uh, sorry, so we've got 32 local authorities in Scotland and only 10 of them, only 10, give free music lessons now. We used to give music lessons to everybody. Now, because of the cuts over the years, there's only 10 out of 32 local authorities that give free music lessons. But by the way, we're just about to have the new batch of nuclear weapons at a cost of £200 billion a go. Come on! When, where in life are you going to prioritise nuclear weapons instead of teaching the Waynes how to play the piano or the violin or the, or the trumpet? For God's sake, surely we have to have those things as a priority instead of bombing and killing people. Destroying people's creativity. It's a brilliant um, way to leave it, Tommy. Uh, f follow Tommy on Twitter. It's at Citizen Tommy on Twitter. Thanks for giving us so much of your time and speaking about all of those different subjects Pleasure, uh, and engaging. And, uh, don't and I just, can my final words be, yes. um, Rick, because I, I, I wanted to do this. On the 5th of May in Glasgow, Kelvin Grove Park, 11 a.m. My appeal to the indie family across Scotland who are listening to the show, get yourself to Kelvin Grove Park on the 5th of May, 11 a.m., and let's march through Glasgow and show the unionists loud and clear that not only is there an appetite for independence, but we're going to win this time. Brilliant to hear from you again. Don't leave it a, a year before you come back on, Tommy. Thanks for your time. Take care. Cheers. Bye for now. Tommy Sheridan live on the line from his home uh, this evening. Uh, do follow him again. Once again, it's at Citizen Tommy on Twitter. Really good stuff. That a lot of comments uh, came in during that section.